Good morning. This morning we're continuing to the next episode in the Joseph story. If you have missed any of the previous episodes, then they are available on our YouTube channel. Having been left on the edge of our seats the previous week, last week the tension was relieved as Joseph made himself known to his brothers, resulting in a wonderful family reunion, after which Joseph's brothers set off to Canaan to go and get their father and their families. This week's episode seems positively pedestrian, excuse the pun, compared to the drama of the previous weeks, but it is nonetheless a very significant piece in the overall jigsaw of the Joseph story. To provide us some context to today's episode, we're going to reread the seven verses of Genesis 46, miss out the list of names in 8 to 26, as important as they are, pick up the story again in verse 27 and read to the end of the chapter 47. So please turn with me, if you would, to Genesis 46 and verse 1. Genesis 46 verse 1. So Israel set out with all that was his. And when he reached Beersheba, he offered sacrifices to the God of his father Isaac. And God spoke to Israel in a vision at night and said, Jacob, Jacob, here am I, he replied. I am God, the God of your father, he said. Do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down to Egypt with you, and I will surely bring you back again. And Joseph's own hand will close your eyes. Then Jacob left Beersheba, and Israel's sons took their father Jacob and their children and their wives in the carts that Pharaoh had sent to transport them. They also took with them their livestock and their possessions they had acquired in Canaan. And Jacob and all his offspring went to Egypt. He took with him to Egypt his sons and grandsons and his daughters and granddaughters, all his offspring. We move now on to verse 27. With the two sons who had been born to Joseph in Egypt, the members of Jacob's family which went to Egypt were 70 in all. Now Jacob sent Judah ahead of him to Joseph to get directions to Goshen. When they arrived in the region of Goshen, Joseph had his chariot made ready and went to Goshen to meet his father Israel. As soon as Joseph appeared before him, he threw his arms around his father and wept for a long time. Israel said to Joseph, Now I am ready to die, since I have seen for myself that you are still alive. Then Joseph said to his brothers and to his father's household, I will go up and speak to Pharaoh, and will say to him, My brothers and my father's household, who were living in the land of Canaan, have come to me. The men are shepherds, they tend livestock, and they have brought along their flocks and herds, and everything they own. When Pharaoh calls you in and asks, What is your occupation? You should answer, Your servants have tended livestock from, a boy, from our boyhood on just as our fathers did. Then you will be allowed to settle in the region of Goshen, for all shepherds are detestable to the Egyptians. Joseph went and told Pharaoh, My father and brothers with their flocks and herds and everything they own have come from the land of Canaan and now are in Goshen. He chose five of his brothers and presented them before Pharaoh. Pharaoh asked the brothers, What is your occupation? Your servants are shepherds, they replied to Pharaoh, just as our fathers were. They also said to him, We have come to live here a while, because the famine is severe in Canaan, and your servants' flocks 
have no pasture. So now let your servants settle in Goshen. Pharaoh said to Joseph, your father and your brothers have come to you and the land of Egypt is before you. Settle your father and your brothers in the best part of the land. Let them live in Goshen. And if you know of any among them with special ability, put them in charge of my own livestock. Then Joseph brought his father Jacob in and presented him before Pharaoh. After Jacob blessed Pharaoh, Pharaoh asked him, How old are you? And Jacob said to Pharaoh, The years of my pilgrimage are a hundred and thirty. My years have been few and difficult, and they do not equal the years of the pilgrimage of my fathers. Then Jacob blessed Pharaoh and went out of his presence. So Joseph settled his father and his brothers in Egypt and gave them property in the best part of the land, the district of Ramesses, as Pharaoh directed. Joseph also provided his father and his brothers and all his father's household with food according to the number of their children. There was no food, however, in the whole region because the famine was severe. Both Egypt and Canaan wasted away because of the famine. Joseph collected all the money that was to be found in Egypt and Canaan in payment for the grain they were buying, and he brought it to Pharaoh's palace. When the money of the people of Egypt and Canaan was gone, all Egypt came to Joseph and said, Give us food. Why should we die before your eyes? Our money is used up. Then bring your livestock, said Joseph. I will sell you food in exchange for your livestock, since your money is gone. So they brought their livestock to Joseph, and he gave them food in exchange for their horses, their sheep and their goats, their cattle and their donkeys. And he brought them through that year with food in exchange for all their livestock. When that year was over, they came to him the following year and said, We cannot hide from our Lord the fact that since our money is gone and our livestock belongs to you, there is nothing left for our Lord except our bodies and our land. Why should we perish before your eyes, we and our land as well? Buy us and our land in exchange for food and we with our land will be in bondage to Pharaoh. Give us seed so that we may live and not die, and that the land may not become desolate. So Joseph bought all the land in Egypt for Pharaoh. The Egyptians, one and all, sold their fields because the famine was so severe for them. The land became Pharaoh's, and Joseph reduced the people to servitude from one end of Egypt to the other. However, he did not buy the land of the priests because they received a regular allotment from Pharaoh and had food enough from the allotment Pharaoh gave them. That is why they did not sell their land. Joseph said to the people, Now that I have brought you and your land today for Pharaoh, here is seed for you, so that you can plant the ground. But when the crops come in, give a fifth of it to Pharaoh. The other four fifths you may keep as seed for the fields and for food for yourselves and for your household and your children. You have saved our lives, they said. May we find favour in the eyes of our Lord. We will be in bondage to Pharaoh. So Joseph established it as a law concerning, uh, law concerning land in Egypt, still in force today, that a fifth of the produce belongs to Pharaoh. It was only the land of the priests that did not become Pharaoh's. Now the Israelites settled in Egypt in the region of Goshen. They acquired property there and were fruitful and increased greatly in number. Jacob lived in Egypt 17 years and the years of his life were 147. When the time drew near for Israel to die, 
he called for his son Joseph and said to him, If I have found favour in your eyes, put your hand under my thigh and promise that you will show kindness and faithfulness to me. Do not bury me in Egypt, but when I rest with my fathers, carry me out of Egypt and bury me where they are buried. I will do as you say, he said. Swear to me, he said. Then Joseph swore to him, and Israel worshipped as he leaned on the top of his staff. Let's take a moment and pray. Father God, as this story seems to slow, cause us to slow down so that we can take in all that you want to teach us this morning. Lord Jesus Christ, as we listen to the story of the salvation that came to Jacob and his family through Joseph, we thank you for the salvation that you have gained for us, that is far greater. Holy Spirit, we come once again to this story, each of us from different perspectives, and peculiar circumstances. So we ask you, Holy Spirit, who dwells within us all, speak to us clearly, both individually and together as a church. Help us to listen, to hear, and to put into practice all that you are teaching us. For we recognise that we need you in order to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus and to cause the world to be transformed for the glory of God the Father, God the Son and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we've read the various episodes in the story of Joseph, they have generally worked as standalone stories in which we've been able to identify various lessons that we could learn to apply to our situations. However, this morning's passage is a helpful reminder that the Joseph story does not stand by itself. But it is a story within a bigger story. In fact, it might be better to say the Joseph story is a part of the overall Jacob or Israel story. However, however, even that is not the whole picture, for the Jacob story is part of the Abraham story, which is part of the whole world story, starting with God and the trees in the garden in Genesis 1, and concluding with God and the trees in the city in Revelation 22. As we consider the passage that we've just read, it speaks of Joseph, but also of Jacob or Israel, and the fruitfulness of that family, but also of the blessings that experienced by the nation of Egypt. And we often find that this, the blessings to Egypt, are often neglected. So this morning we're going to very briefly focus on three things and maybe look at them from a slightly strange angle. So we're going to look at Jacob or Israel as a recipient and supplier of blessing. We're going to look at Egypt as a place of refuge, rescue and growth. And we're going to look at Joseph as a channel of blessing and an architect of oppression, potentially. So let's start with Jacob or Israel. Here at the start of Genesis 46, as the focus turns to Jacob, we see that the Joseph story is really part of the overall Jacob story and the bigger stories beyond that. In verse 3 we read, I am God, the God of your father, he said. Do not be afraid to go to, down to Egypt, for I will make you into a great nation there. I will go down to Egypt with you, and I will surely bring you back again, and Joseph's own hand will close your eyes. We cannot overemphasize the importance of this verse, for it is God's self-revelation to Jacob, reminding him of his place in the bigger story. Not only that, but God tell, tells Jacob that he is still in control, despite all the evidence to the contrary. And he says, 
He will fulfill his promises to Jacob or Israel as a nation and to Jacob personally. Furthermore, God himself will go down to Egypt with Jacob and he will return to the land of Canaan with him also. Without the knowledge of the bigger story of Abraham, Jacob's grandfather, and the promises of Genesis 12, 15 and 17, the words, do not be afraid to go down to Egypt, would make little sense. Leaving the promised land, lock, stock and barrel, most probably seemed totally nonsensical to Jacob. How will God achieve his promises if I la leave the land of promise? Here we get a glimpse of a vitally important lesson repeated throughout scripture. The fulfillment of God's promises is based on God's presence. Let me repeat that. The fulfillment of God's promises is based on God's presence. Here, Jacob or Israel learned that it is God's presence that makes the land the land of promise. If we could but grasp something of the importance of God's presence. Listen to a later story from Moses where Moses says uh, in Exodus 33 verse 15, If your presence does not go, does not go with us, do not send us up from here. What else will distinguish me and your people from all the other peoples on the face of the earth? God's presence is the distinctive of God's people. We may have beautiful buildings, but if God is not present in the people, there is no difference between them and any other person in the world. I hope that I do not need to press this point any further, but it is this that helps us grasp the awesomeness of Emmanuel, God with us, or Jesus' promise, surely I am with you always. God's presence with us. During these difficult days, when we are not able to be in our building, it is important that we, like the people of Israel over the years, grasp this important fact. It is not our presence in a place that makes us distinctive. It is God's presence within us that does. It is not our presence in a place that makes us distinctive. It is God's presence within us that does. We've hardly begun to scratch the surface of this passage or the wonderful truths found within it. But let's press on to the next important aspect that we see of Jacob. Jacob, or Israel, was not only the recipient of God's blessing, as we see in the promises made to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you, as is repeated in our passage. He was also to be a supplier of blessing for all the peoples on the earth will be blessed through you. The blessing that flowed into Jacob or Israel was always intended to flow out of him so that others are blessed. Not Endor Herrick which means without outflow, like the Dead Sea, but has a flow in and out. Our, in our passage, we read the, how Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Some may suggest that this was simply a greeting, but surely even a greeting or a farewell can carry something of the blessing of God, especially if your God-given purpose in life is to be a blessing. However, let's ponder for a moment, assuming that this truly is a blessing. There he is, Jacob, standing before Pharaoh, a godlike ruler of the richest nation anywhere around. And Jacob, an old aged, penniless, foreign migrant, despised shepherd. So. Who is it that's blessing who? It's Jacob blessing Pharaoh. 
Even Jacob describes himself and his life as a life as a difficult pilgrimage. And we know from what the Bible stories say uh, that many of those difficulties have been of his own making. How can such a flawed individual be the one doing the blessing? Well, that's grace. God can use the weakest and most flawed individual to bring about his blessing because it is God at work in us and through us that will bless others. It is as we receive God's blessing through his grace that we will be able to share that blessing with others. We'll see more of this in the episodes to come. Now let's turn our attention to Egypt. If we talk of Egypt, it is generally inextricably linked with the Exodus and has become the byword for the bondage Israel escaped. Egypt is forever linked with slavery and stands as a metaphor for the oppression of sin. In a similar way, when we speak of the wilderness or a wilderness experience, more often than not, we are talking of something negative because they have become synonymous. Interestingly, at our recent Wednesday prayer uh, meeting, uh, someone shared how the wilderness need not always be a negative experience. Here in this story, we read Egypt is a place of refuge for the people of Israel, a place of rescue and of salvation, a place of fruitfulness and of great increase, a place where God's promises were fulfilled. Now, that's not how we normally see Egypt. You see, Egypt started out very positively, but it was only supposed to be temporary. It was not the place that God had promised. Jacob knew this. And we see in Genesis 47, 29 to 31, he ensured that even in death, he did not stay there. We do not have a clear picture of why the people of Israel stayed in Egypt after the famine had finished. But they were provided for and it seems that they had become settled and comfortable. Even after they did return to Canaan to bury their father Jacob, they went back to Egypt to live. Now there's a danger here that we allow the silence of scripture to speak too loudly. But it's easy to recognise the temptation that comfort and prosperity present, causing us to settle where we were only ever supposed to sojourn. How easy it is for us to enjoy the comforts and blessings of where we are, especially if God has led us there, rather than recognising this is not our home. As Hebrews 11 reminds us, we are aliens and strangers on earth whose true home is a heavenly one. Oh, how easy it is to let the place of God's blessing become a bondage when we forget where our true home is, our heavenly home. So now we turn to the final aspect from our passage and return to Joseph himself. We have spoken about Jacob or Israel being a blessing to the nations and clearly God used Joseph to bless the land of Egypt and to save the people from starvation. And as one commentator put it, through these economic measures, Joseph serves as the channel for blessing on Pharaoh and his people, stated seven times. I haven't checked whether it is stated seven times or not. But Joseph is certainly the channel of God's blessing. When looking at the Joseph story, it's easy to hold him up as the paragon of virtue, as an exemplar that we should follow. And many of us are not adverse to using theological sleight of hand to erase his faults so that he can be that paragon of virtue. However, 
like almost every other biblical character, Joseph is flawed. Just like us. We can be in little doubt that Joseph was used by God to deliver his family and Egypt from a catastrophe. But as we read about how his economic measures uh, were introduced, they caused people to be subjugated to Pharaoh. And we might well wonder if Joseph was the architect of the oppression that led to his family's later desire for the exodus. In life, sometimes the decisions we take seem to be right to us at the time. But they often turn out to have unforeseen consequences and with hindsight we may well have taken a different decision if we'd known about them. The headline and opening paragraph in Christianity Today this week was as followed. Failed Trump prophecies offer a lesson in humility. The failed prophecies of Donald Trump's re-election may have damaged the credibility of the US independent charismatic wing of evangelicalism more than any event since the televangelist scandals of the 1980s. As much as Joseph was God's man of the moment, surely one of the key lessons of the Joseph story is the need for humility. The conclusion of the article I mentioned said, Christians may disagree amongst ourselves, but where we have divided from one another by putting politics over the one body that Christ died for, repentance is in order. The repentant prophets show us a way forward. If we seek revival, then repentance and humility are a good place to start. Professor Keenan does not limit these Christian disagreements to politics, as earlier he highlights that even scripture must be interpreted and diverse interpretations and political biases surface. So where these divide us, repentance is also in order. There is so much that we can learn from the Joseph story, but let's conclude for now. From the three things that we've looked at, what can we learn? From Jacob, or Israel, a recipient and supplier of blessing, we can learn the fulfilment of God's promises is based on God's presence. Let's spend time more and more in God's presence. And if we do, we will see God's promises fulfilled more and more. And from Egypt, a place of refuge, rescue and growth, we can learn that the place of God's blessing can become a bondage when we forget our home. If we become too settled in this earth, in what we're doing here, and we don't recognise that we are to build the kingdom of God, then this place can become a bondage. That's not to say we just look forward to the heavenly place, our heavenly home. Yes, we do. But we also seek to build God's kingdom here. We have a heavenly perspective. If we don't have that heavenly perspective, we will end up, in bondage. And from Joseph, a channel of blessing and an architect of oppression, we can learn even God's man of the moment is flawed. So we need to remember humility. And when we get it wrong, let us repent. Let's keep humble and repentant and it is through that that we will see revival. May God in his grace and mercy teach us what we need to learn today and every day, that we may remain teachable before him. Let's conclude by praying. Father God, we want to learn more of you. We want to become more like Jesus. Holy Spirit, help us. Lord, so often we are blind 
to our own faults and failings. We push our own agendas and we don't hear where you're leading us. Help us to practice your presence, to spend time with you, all the time, daily, listening to you. Help us to remain humble, looking forward to the day that will come when we will see you again. But Father God, not looking forward so much that we don't look to the present and build your kingdom here. So help us, Holy Spirit, we pray, now and every day. In Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to worship.